Well, thank you. These are my esteemed colleagues for the panel. Um, Suber, um, who just gave the talk, is from the Retina Center um, of Ohio, leads the Future Vision Foundation. Aaron Osborne, um, who's an ophthalmologist, drug developer, and consultant. Um, before that, uh, uh, has has been very much involved in drug delivery. Uh, Jose Sahel, welcome Jose. He's the chair of Pittsburgh. You've heard his name a number of times with a few of the companies. And Charlie Wyckoff, um, retina consultant of Texas, also involved in a number of great trials. So welcome to you and we'll just get started. Um, have a lot of questions here that were provoked by some of the talks earlier. So, um, so what, what do you think about role of genetic manipulation? I'll start off with um, Jose. I mean, this is now treating uh, a, a particular genetic defect. Where do you think this um, comes to play? Um, yes, and, and uh, could you give us some examples of how you see this coming through? I mean, we've had Luxterna as the first, um, you know, really success. Where are we going from here? Well, I think we were very lucky with Luxterna because uh, this is an RPE disease, so photoreceptors are affected secondarily. It's also like an enzymatic defect, and it really helped all the field to get where we are with this proof of concept and a clear demonstration that is now confirmed in the, after the approval with so many kids benefiting from the therapy and uh, now post-market analysis of the safety. Uh, clearly, this leaves open several questions. One of them is what happens when the photoreceptors are already advanced in the stage of degeneration? Are you able to reverse that? Is there a stage where it's too late to reverse that? And actually, this question was raised uh, regarding Luxterna uh, in uh, several important papers, asking whether maybe at some point it's too late to stop the process. Uh, the other question is that you have so many gene defects and so many mechanisms of uh, disease that uh, just blocking the function uh, or replacing the function may not be enough. And this is where we hear about many other technologies like the uh, gene editing and the RN approaches, for example, that look uh, very, very appealing. Uh, I always thought that uh, we would be in a good situation if we have we are able to correct many gene defects at the early stages of a disease, but we know that many patients come later than that. They come at a stage where most of the road photoreceptors have already undergone very significant degeneration. So what happens next? And this is where all the gene-independent approaches, we heard about this a couple of times today, are probably likely uh, to play a key role. So I won't advocate for my own approaches, but I am very happy to see that so many groups are now working on these gene agnostic, we call that gene agnostic approaches, uh, that are certainly uh, very appealing. So the field is, uh, it's not going to be like we have one therapy for everything, uh, it's not magical, but uh, certainly a spectrum of approaches that are going to target uh, uh, different types of patient. The key question after that is uh, who is going to pay for so many approaches? How the economic model for that is going right. to be sustainable? Yep. Thank you, Jose, for addressing, you know, treating with gene therapy, monogenetic, monogenetic diseases. Um, but before we leave that, and there are a lot of other things to discuss here, um, CRISPR-Cas is one way to uh, fix this. We've heard a lot about that. There's a company, uh, CRISPR um, that's trading in the NASDAQ. We heard a little bit about Editas results. Uh, does anybody want to comment on CRISPR-Cas? What do you think uh, it holds for using that approach as uh, gene editing and insertion, both deleting and insertion therapy? So does anybody want to tackle that? That's a tough, tough one. Uh, so yeah, Jose, why don't you take on CRISPR-Cas? Yeah. So, well, this is a perfect example of a disconnect between the market expectations and the reality. So results were announced two weeks ago. It's supposed to be a safety study. So it's great news to see that uh, CRISPR-Cas is safe. So it shows that this approach is certainly something that we want to pursue. And if you talk about only two or three or four patients, it's too early to say whether this is already significant or not significant. And it's interesting to see how the market has re reacted to that. And so there is certainly some sort of disconnect between the two. So this is one of these very promising approaches that uh, we are all excited about. 
it will be very cell-specific. It might be mutation-specific within a specific gene, so it's going to be even more challenging to develop that as an economic model. But this is certainly one of these uh, very important promises for the future. Great. Question is, do you want to have this as a permanent mechanism? You're, do you want to correct a gene defect for once or forever? And uh, this is something which is not yet solved. Right. Right. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to probably the, the area that everyone is waiting to jump into is genetic manipulation for drug delivery. So we've heard some great talks, um, and uh, we would like to see what you think of of that approach. So, Charlie, any thoughts on, on your involvement? I know you're involved with Regenix Bio. Where do you think this is going um, in terms of genetic manipulation for drug delivery? I think it's incredibly exciting. I'm glad to see many, many partners and sponsors playing in this space. And I think we've learned a lot, but I think my, my take home message that I internalize regularly is that we still have a lot to learn. Right? This, is a, this is a challenge, right? To be able to, to create a biofactory that can sustainably and safely produce a protein inside the eye that has a therapeutic effect is a, is a fantastic idea that's been really validated now in two human programs. It's really exciting to see that move into sort of a pivotal stage analyses here with, with RegenX. Um, but I still do think we have a lot to learn. I think it's exciting. It's, it's incredibly impressive, the ability to produce these proteins long-term in non-human primates and also humans now through many months, even years um, inside the eye in a human. So I think there's great potential here. I think it's fantastic. The efficacy data is overall strong. You know, there's incredible heterogeneity in these anti-VEGF dependent diseases with different VEGF loads. And so it makes sense that some patients are gonna probably need supplemental exogenous bolus therapy on top of a baseline of, of anti-VEGF protein production. Um, but I don't think it's a surprise to see an occasional patient that has breakthrough disease and needs top-ups in any of these programs. I think the core here, having seen this sort of safe, productive um, generation of anti-VEGF protein is really the safety, the long-term safety, right? I mean, there's key questions. I think we've addressed the fact pretty clearly that over, you know, you know an inhibition of VEGF in a human eye does not dramatically accelerate geographic atrophy. There's been a lot of analyses on that over many years. And I think uh, that question is still a little bit lingering, but answered in my mind. It's really more what is the long-term effect on the tissue that's being transfected, first of all? Um, do you change the function of that tissue? So when you, when you change an RPE cell to now be a biofactory, or you change any other cell in the back of the eye to produce a protein they're not used to producing, do you change that cell's ability to do its native function? And, and what's, the, what's the importance of that long-term? I think we have a lot to learn. And then what about the you know, inflammatory responses? Some programs are seeing more inflammatory challenges than others. And I've come to be very respectful of even very mild signs of inflammation. They must be respected because it's so we don't know the long-term consequences of that. So we need to take inflammation in this context very seriously. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, to be careful about not altering the native function of the cell is something that we all are concerned about and think about. And it's a very good point to bring up. Uh, we're so focused on the anti-VEGF that's being produced and the great results, but then what else is happening to that cell is really important to keep in mind. So Aaron, I know you were with that Barum, and so question for you is, you know, we've heard supercoidal delivery for, for this, these approaches. Um, Regenix is also doing subretinal and supercoidal. At Barum, you were doing intravitreal. Uh, what are your thoughts on where these vectors should be put into and, and delivered? their concerns about internal limiting membrane acting as a barrier. Uh, could you comment a bit on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, if, I mean first of all, just want to say that it's great to be here and uh, to be in a face-to-face -face meeting. It's the first one in a long time and a really exciting technology, such a broad kind of array of approaches. Um, and I think it's kind of that, the way that I would look at this if you, is you've got disease um, specifics and you've got vector characteristics. So, I mean, I think for a, for a biofactory approach, we've generally been relatively agnostic about which uh, cells are specifically transduced. I mean, Charlie's point is a, is, a, is, a, is a really important one, but in terms of producing it, if we can replicate, you know, meaningful concentrations inside the vitreous, then it should be analogous to intravitreal injections, but have a much sort of improved PK profile, you're avoiding those peaks and troughs, which could result in better outcomes for the disease in the long term. So I think, you know, different vectors are tropic for different tissues. Um, AEV8, 
for example, maybe better delivered subretinally or supracoroidally, whereas AV7MA was specifically developed for intravitreal administration. Um, I think, um, you know, if you go to, I thought what was interesting as well was the nanoscope presentation. And there you're looking to actually restore or give a new function to bipolar cells here um, and, and using this multi-characteristic opsin. And again, there I think it's probably going to be advantageous as they're using to use an intravitreal approach to be able to target those. So a, a, a big part about the target tissue as well and the type of disease. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So that leads us to um, the question about what other, um, then, you know, in terms of this gene therapy approaches, you know, the optogenetic approach, which we heard about, which you just talked about, the um, opsins. Um, very interesting idea. Now you're, you're, instead of making it a biofactory, you're making the cell light sensitive. In this case, um, as you heard, the bipolar cells. Um, Jose, you have some experience with this as well in your studies. Uh, I know you published a, a, at least a single subject report on this. Um, so it's not an injection. Obviously, it's also a wearable device. Uh, Samar also talked about that. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, can you inject this intravitreally? Uh, does it really go to the bipolar cell? Does it go elsewhere? And then the third question is about the wearable. Yeah, well, so our approach was a bit uh, different from the nanoscope because we targeted the ganglion cells. And uh, it's uh, an intravitreal injection with no vitrectomy combined with a medical device to stimulate in the wavelength, so non-toxic wavelength, it's uh, in the red amber, and the amplitude of light is uh, totally uh, sustainable. Uh, the uh, advantage of that is you can adapt too many levels of lighting. We live in uh, 11 log units of lighting, and no single protein can adapt to that. Uh, you need, uh, uh, we have so many adaptive systems in the eye to adjust too many levels of lighting, so this is one of the advantages of a wearable. Obviously, people we prefer to be without a wearable, which is understandable, but this is one of the advantages. So we, we have reported results uh, and published results on the first patient. After 15 years of work in animal models, we targeted cone cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, ganglion cells, before we developed this clinical trial, which is ongoing. Now we got uh, approval to an extension cohort. As we reported, uh, because of COVID, many patients couldn't come back for training and adjustment, but now we are coming back, so we, are, we have more to report, hopefully, by, by the academy. Uh, but it's nice to see optogenetics as emerging as a field. As you know, there's a lot of investment re recently from pharma into it, and it's certainly one of these gene-independent approaches. Uh, I still believe that it's going to target late stages of a disease because the level of vision that we will be able to restore is probably not something that is... Uh, uh, 2200 or 2040. Hopefully it will happen. I, I hear that it may be happening, but uh, I think we are still in the range of uh, transforming blind people into low vision people, but not low vision people into normal vision people. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, question there, uh, Jose, one more question. Why would you, I mean, I, I we targeted the ganglion cells with the Argus 2. Um, you're targeting the ganglion cells is there any reason you said you you walk through this this whole algorithm, you know, dormant photoreceptors, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, and you settled on the ganglion cells? Any reason why you settled on the ganglion cells? Yeah. So for the cones, we we still have two active programs on cones, so it's not uh, we have not given up on that. But uh, the issue we were facing is that uh, in advanced RP, only 20% of patients have remaining cones that are dormant. So you have 80% of the patients that don't have cones. Bipolar cells, until recently, so I'm hearing from Nanoscope, there is also a company in Switzerland that has been able to, to get through that, apparently. There was no good promoters that was working in the, in the primate and in humans. There were good promoters, good vectors targeting onion cells in the mouse, but in humans and primate was not working. So it's, if it is working now, this is nice, especially if you can be selective or on or off bipolar cells, because we have done it and it works beautifully in the mouse. Uh, ganglion cells are very accessible for the vitreous. They stay forever. I mean, uh, you know that from the Argus, we, we did so much with this patient. So almost every patient with RP still has ganglion cells that can be targeted. So this is the beauty of it. The disadvantage is that uh, you are currently targeting all types of ganglion cells. So the level of resolution, similar like uh, epiretinal prosthesis, is not great. But patients are finding ways to cope with that, as you know, with eye movements and, uh, and hand movements. So it's a, it's a spectrum of technologies. Uh, uh, I don't think any of them is, is wrong. It just depends on the stage and the, what is working. Yeah. 
Uh, one more question uh, is um, obviously, sorry, Jose, keep asking you, but uh, it, one question that I have is the wearable part of it. You know, we focus so much on the ops and the promoter or the vectors, but there is a wearable component. iTech, what I call iTech, is something that you wear, and there are significant things you could do. Any thoughts on, uh, obviously, Samar presented great data on the multiple wavelengths that you can use, but there's so much more beyond that that you could do with a wearable LCD screen, you know, image enhancement, contrast sensitivity. I mean, this is what we can do on our phone. Essentially, you can do in that wearable and you can make that wearable uh, also project light, you know, into very small areas. So thoughts along those lines? Yes. Yeah. Well, we, there are many advantages to the wearable. The first thing is that you can change them all the time. The technology is constantly evolving. So you do the injection to the patient. You don't have to get back into the eye and you can enhance that. The advantage also is that the patients are telling us a lot of things. Currently, the patient in the trial, like we had with the artificial retina, they keep telling us this is working, this is not working. So you can adjust the software, you can enhance the image, taking into account the patient experience and adjust to that. The other advantage is that we decided to use not a classical camera, but what is called a bio-inspired or neuromorphic camera. So these cameras are working pixel by pixel to detect single changes in levels of lighting, like do retinal cells. Retinal cells are functioning only for any change in lighting. So it's like talking to the retina the way it used to talk to, to the light. And so there are many advantages, but the main thing is that if a wearable is not so good, and currently we are already at the third generation of a wearable, just based on what patient feedback is, is, is collected, uh, you can make it evolve many times over time. And we see that with uh, many brain computer interfaces that the pr program the program you can use can be enhanced so much over time. Great, thank you. Any last uh, comments on uh, gene therapy from the panel? And then we'll go on to cell therapy for the last few minutes here. Our next slide, please. Um, Mark, I'll just make one last comment is that, uh, you know, a lot of the focus ever since uh, Folkman uh, identified tumor angiogenesis factor, we keep looking for the magic bullet. And a lot of what we do with gene therapy is focused on a single uh, molecular pathway. Uh, I think Charlie made a good point is that we really don't know the long-term effects of uh, either helping a cell, a biofactory, when we burn out that cell, we alter its natural history. We need just to be very, very uh, careful about that. Also, we haven't really mentioned things like payload and things for uh, AAV, which is a very efficient, a really wonderful vector, lots of different choices, but there are lots of things that aren't addressed by that. And the long-term effects of CRISPR and so forth are, are not really well known. So I do think, and, and I think Praveen Dougal's uh, uh, presentation is very good, that the body is very jealous of its uh, protective mechanisms. So I think we're, uh, we always should wonder whether we're, do we're doing phenomenology or fundamentally changing the disease course. I think that's really important as we assess these therapies going forward. Well, thanks, Huber. So I'll direct the next question to you. So you talked, you presented and talked about the importance of a basement membrane for cell therapy. Otherwise, cells will not form a monolayer, won't be oriented properly. Um, we know in geographic atrophy advanced cases, the Brooks membrane is not there. So it's not just the cells are not there but the membrane that they usually sit on is also not there. Do you have any further thoughts on, you know, a lot of, a lot of approaches are just using suspension. Suspensions are a whole lot easier. You can just inject a slurry. Uh, you know, if you're going to put a scaffold in, you have to do surgery and fold a scaffold in subretinal space. Any comments on suspension versus scaffolds? Yeah, I, I, um, I can't do a Texas accent or a French accent or or one from uh, the, the UK. I'll just use my Cleveland accent to say I'm sort of simple-minded about this. I think if we look at cells, except for um, blood cells, almost all cells uh, derive in an organized pattern to form sheets of, of tissue. I think that's pretty common. And if we, even if we say that it's a, a fairly dumb cell, if we had a, a truck load of bricks and we just dumped them into a space, how likely is that they would like or, uh, organize into a single monolayer on, the mo on their own? We know, for instance, that normal cells have contact inhibition. So even piling on top of themselves may even further decrease their likelihood of, of being efficiently functional. Uh, maybe they will turn over, but they're not turtles. They're more like leaves. And some may turn over, some may not turn over. And again, it has to do with efficiency. So things that might work in the lab, in my simple-minded way, we have to understand, can we 
account uh, engraftment, how efficient can that be and how can efficient every cell that we engraft, um, uh, uh, how, how well can that function? So for me, a slurry of, of cells, some of which may have orientation, may not have orientation, or otherwise may have negative effects, may not be as good as uh, scaffolding, which occurs virtually in every structural um, uh, system in biology. So for me, I think there's promise in both ways. I think we've seen some excellent results where anatomically it good, looks good, but the question is, is it functionally looks good, does it metabolically look good, and is it efficient um, as a commercial product? I think those are things yet to be uh, determined. Jose, you had a quick comment? Yeah, well, we did the comparison actually even in animals and uh, the amount of the number of cells that survive with suspension is one tenth of what you have when you have polarized layers. So which means that 90% of the cells you're injecting are going to die, elicit an inflammatory response, or be of no use to the patient and to the retina. So it's very clear that having a monolayer is a very physiological approach. It's a polarized epithelium. There is no rational uh, uh, well, if it works, that's fine, but at least uh, it makes a lot of sense to go back to the anatomy and, and the polarization of the RPE. And the results were very clear. We published that, and many of us did. There is no question that having a, a basement membrane-like uh, material is a, a key importance for replacing the RPE. So one, one more question for you, Suber. Um, so IPS versus HESC. So IPS, idiop Pathic pluripotent cells basically um, take cells from you know your skin or somewhere, use the Yamanaka factors, won the Nobel Prize, reverse them back to a stem cell, pluripotent cell, and then direct them back into making the cell you want. The advantage of that, of course, is it's your cell. So if you do that, no immune suppression needed. If you take an embryonic stem cell, which is the HESC, well, it's not from you. We can get it down to the cell type we need, like the RPE, but you need some limited immune suppression. Although you did show some very interesting results two years out uh, of a patient. I think it may be the very first patient that we have seen where the cells that were transplanted from embryonic stem cell derived RPE was still present. Uh, so can you comment on the immune privilege of the retina, of the eye, and, and what do you think of IPS versus HESC? Well, I guess the proof is in the, in the pudding. I think that we, uh, our marker is looking for inflammation, which is a very poor marker, I think. And I think that there are certainly rationale for using a, the patient's own cells uh, because there may be things that we can't see or cannot measure that, that, um, uh, that are beneficial. Embryonic stem cells have another layer of, of potential uh, concerns that may be raised, and that may be both a scientific as well as a commercial issue. So I think the idea that if you can control the process using the patient's own cells, I think there's a, a rationale that's very going to be very appealing going forward. It, it remains to be seen whether that's a more effective approach. Great. Thank you. Well, I, I got a little too ambitious. I put two other things out there. The, first, the third bullet is the role of organoids. So basically you take uh, a stem cell, a blastocyst, you can make a whole retina out of it in a dish. You can test drugs on it, and that's all ongoing. I think that's, um, we'll leave that alone for a bit. But the, the fourth bullet is sort of my dream, if it's possible, to do what the CAR T story has done for cancer, right? I mean, it basically transforms your T cells to fight cancers. Can we, you guys think on the panel, can we transform T cells that could potentially fight, you know, macular degeneration, uh, dry macular degeneration, some of these really difficult problems? Any thoughts? I mean, this is a pie in the sky, out of the box type of thinking. Anyone yeah. wants to say anything about that? Charlie? Yeah, my, my thought there is that, and I agree with what, what, what Jose said, the concept that, especially these atrophic diseases, it makes sense that different therapeutics may be more valuable at different stages of the disease. And if you just think about geographic atrophy, ideally a holy grail would be going obviously before geographic atrophy exists and finding a therapeutic that could prevent the development. But once you have geographic atrophy, it makes sense you'd have a different therapeutic or a cocktail of therapeutics to treat early stages of GA. And then once you have large atrophic zones, obviously need to replace the, the, the cells. I think the, one of the most interesting things I've thought about recently is this, is this senescent concept never loved the idea of killing anything in the back of the eye, but if you could silence some cells that are, that are, that are being bad actors in the local area that are driving the phenotype, 
I think that's fascinating. And, and an immunological response in a context like that might make a lot of sense. To get some T killer cells to get the senescent cells. Aaron, did you want to say anything on this topic? It's kind of out there. So uh, with that, uh, we'll close. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panelists and thank you all. We're at a, uh, oh.